the loon has become for us the spirit of the wilderness. It epitomizes the beauty of things wild. Loons capture the imagination, tugging at some special feeling we have for wildness. Is it their sudden arrival on the lake just after the ice goes out? Their call echoing across the water? Red eyes, the blackest black and whitest white? What mystery surrounds these magnificent birds? This is the story of one population of common loons that spends the summer on the waters in and around Squam Lake, known as Golden Pond, and Bow Lake in central New Hampshire. A story repeated on thousands of lakes across the north every year, and one that we hope continues to be told. But the story begins on the Atlantic Ocean, where loons spend the winter hundreds of miles away from these northern lakes. If you went to see loons in winter, you would have to look among the waves on the ocean or ride with the tide up a coastal river. Yet only a sharp-eyed observer will recognize the distinctive profile of this silent gray bird bobbing in the ocean and know that it's the same strikingly beautiful black and white bird of summer on the northern lakes. But it's here in the frigid salt water that loons spend the winter. Twice a day on the incoming tide, they come close to shore or move up the river to feed on the fish drawn in with the rush of tidal waters. In these rich tidal basins, loons find the food they need to survive until spring calls them to return north. The loon shares its wintered home with an abundance of other kinds of waterfowl, ocean birds, and marine mammals red-breasted mergansers, common golden eyes, buffle heads, common eiders, old squaws, harlequin ducks, harbor seals, and gulls. But loons don't raft with the other waterfowl, nor fly with gulls. They swim and dive alone, or in small groups of two or three of their own. During late winter, they molt and are unable to fly for a while. The end of the molt and the return of flight signals the beginning of spring on freshwater lakes to which they must return. So when spring arrives in the north and inland fresh water begins to thaw, loons start to move from the ocean toward their ancestral waters across the northern tier of the United States and into Canada. Adult males are the first to leave the wintering waters along the coast, scouting for open fresh water as they hopscotch the thawing lakes north with the spring. And it's to these waters that they fly. The clear mountain lakes with an abundance of fish, protected shorelines and nesting islands draw the loons back year after year as they have for 60 million years. The males arrive first. After the long journey from the sea, they feed and rest in the familiar waters of their youth and wait for the females. We are not the first people to wander about and be fascinated by these unique and special birds. Loons have been an important part of the human experience since pre-Columbian times. In Native American cultures, they occupy a very special place. According to Chippewa Indian legend, long ago, when the world was covered with water, 
the great spirit told the animals that it would be good to have land so they could walk and where forests and grass and flowers would grow. He asked the animals, one at a time, to dive far down to the bottom of the water and bring up mud to make the land, but each failed. Finally, he asked the loon to dive for mud. After a long time, the loon surfaced, but was sad because he believed he too had failed. But as he was waving goodbye to the great spirit, a little mud glistened on his foot. It was enough mud to make land, and the loon became a hero. But today, a conflict exists. Both man and loon require wild places, clear northern lakes with islands and fish. Humans migrate to these places in the spring to recreate. Loons migrate to these places to ensure the continuation of their kind. The pristine quality of these lakes is critical to the successful rearing of young loons. Perhaps clear water is the most important quality. Because loons feed by sight, clear water allows them to see their prey and capture it more efficiently. A lake must have sufficient water depth. It must have protected coves or bays for nurseries. It must contain an abundance of fish and aquatic insects and crustaceans. And a loon pair must be able to locate at least two nesting sites in case the first is disturbed, preferably on islands that face the mainland or along protective shorelines away from wind and hidden from predators. And there must be a minimum of human disturbance. All these criteria must be met if young are to be hatched, reared, and fledged from a lake. Loons are thought to be mated for life. We are unsure of how the male and female find each other year after year, but they seem to. There is little that is spectacular about their courtship ritual. It consists of simply spending time together, swimming, feeding, caring for feathers, and defending the territory against other loons. This togetherness lasts until the pair select a nest site, mate, lay eggs, and rear the young. Loons seldom venture on land. It is easy to see why. A loon's powerful legs are located so far back in its body for swimming and diving that the bird has extreme difficulty walking on land. But when the pair are ready to mate and nest, the male will move on to the shore, many times at the site where the nest will be, and invite the female to come ashore to mate. Soon after mating, the eggs are laid, usually two, two to three days apart. The parents share the long and arduous chore of incubating the eggs through the 26 days required for hatching. In all of nature, there may be no greater instinctive drive than that of parent birds to incubate their eggs. It's not possible to explain, in human terms, the dedication and determination that causes loons to sit for nearly a month during day and night 
in cold and heat, in dry and wet, being bitten by black flies and blood-sucking mosquitoes, and threatened by winged and four-footed predators. Yet more than three weeks pass without any signs of life from within the loon eggs, not a peep nor a mew, to encourage the parents that there is life inside the two olive-colored shells. But they wait, somehow knowing, even through a coming thunderstorm. The loon is generally successful at defending the nest, and the nest is rarely left uncovered. While one parent incubates the eggs, the other is off feeding and preening, but never far away, and always alert to danger from predators and other loons. When it's time for a nest change, it is done quickly. The eggs are rolled several times every hour to flush out carbon dioxide while allowing oxygen to reach the chicks inside. When the loons are on the nest, they are particularly susceptible to human disturbance. If surprised by the sudden approach of people, the loons may leave the nest uncovered, exposing the eggs to predators. Human encroachment on loon nesting territory over the last 100 years, whether from recreation or pollution, has contributed directly to the decline in loon populations. But we know that loons can become accustomed to people and will continue to breed successfully, even when their habitat must be shared with humans. Simple common sense, such as recognition of the loon's territory and consideration of their needs will go a long way toward helping them survive. About three or four days prior to hatching, if all has gone well, the chicks inside the eggs will begin to softly call. The chick's peeping or mewing is a form of bonding with its parents. On the 26th day, right on schedule, the first baby is out of the egg. It weighs just three ounces and is covered with down, black overall except for a white belly. For the first few hours, it will dry off and rest from its ordeal of cutting itself out of the eggshell. But soon, it's ready to explore the world beyond the protective warmth of its brooding parent. While the loon family waits for the second egg to hatch, the first loonling becomes increasingly active. Even at the tender age of less than a day, the tiny bird is able to swim and even dive for about three seconds. 
but like most babies, it is totally dependent on its parents and will be for the next two months. The security of the eggs and young are a constant concern of the parents. At any time during the day or night, a predator may appear from the sky, on the land, or under the water. If this happens, the parents take immediate and dramatic action to defend the chicks. Even the appearance of another loon constitutes a grave threat to the loon family, resulting in aggressive action from both parents. The family will remain at the nest until the second egg hatches, usually 24 to 36 hours after the first. If it goes beyond that, the parents may abandon the egg, concentrating their efforts on the successful rearing of the first loonling. When the second egg finally hatches, the loon family prepares to leave the nesting area, but not until the firstborn establishes who's boss. In human terms, it appears cruel that one chick picks on its sibling, but in nature, there is a rationale for everything. The first chick to hatch is always the dominant one. If food is scarce in the nursery cove, the dominant one will receive most of the food, and in fact, may threaten its sibling with long stares that will cause it to withdraw from the family unit and starve. This behavior is intended to increase the survival chances of at least the one offspring. The loons move away from the nesting site to avoid any predators attracted to the nesting area. During the journey, the young loons may climb up on the backs of their parents to conserve energy, keep warm, and be protected from lurking predators. Ideally, when the family arrives in the nursery cove, it finds shallow water with an abundance of small fish and other aquatic life, along with aquatic vegetation for protection above and below the water. Both parents share the responsibility of rearing and protecting the young. They devote full time to the care and protection of these helpless chicks. When diving for food for the chicks, one parent will remain on the surface, ever vigilant against attack from predators. To locate food, a parent will peer under the water before diving. This is why water clarity is so important. Having seen the prey, it will compress its feathers and wings tightly to the body and dive, propelling itself with its powerful feet. Though the wings may be used to maneuver a turn, loons do not fly through the water like penguins. All of their power comes from their feet. During these early days and weeks of a loon chick's life, it is particularly vulnerable to a variety of life-threatening perils. From above, a young loon may be snatched by gulls, crows, ravens, or even a bald eagle. From below, turtles, particularly snapping turtles, and large fish, including bass, northern pike, and muscalunge, are a constant threat. These threats cause both parents to continuously scan the skies and dip their heads into the water, to search for danger that may be lurking below. Even with all this vigilance by the parents, an average of only one chick per pair survives to the fledgling stage, and 30% of all immature loons do not make it through their first year.
the adults actively teach the chicks to eat. When an adult presents a small fish to its young, it holds it crosswise in its bill. The young loon takes the fish and rotates it 90 degrees so that the fish can be swallowed head first. It takes some practice. As the young loons grow, the parents change their feeding tactics. By the fourth week, instead of presenting a fish directly to the chicks, they drop an immobilized but still living minnow in the water beside them to encourage the youngsters to feed themselves. Though this behavior may have to be repeated time and time again, the hungry young loons eventually get the point. As the summer passes and August arrives, the chicks grow up. Their downy plumage changes from black to brown to gray. By the time they're two months old, they're diving and swimming as well as their parents. The adult birds, for the first time since courtship began in the spring, feel an urge to mingle with other loons. Parent birds from surrounding lakes and unattached adults also feel this urge. The parents take turns flying off to a neutral location, where they participate in what can be called a loon social gathering. In fact, the older the chicks grow, the more apt both parents are to leave them while they socialize with adults from neighboring lakes. What a beautiful sight greets an observer on an early September morning, just at daybreak, as a group of loons cuts a V in the still water. These gatherings of from three to 25 loons may last for three hours and involve ritualized behavior in which the birds circle while calling dipping bills, turning heads, and splash diving. It's thought that during these gatherings, loons feed as a group to become acquainted in preparation for the fall migration. Fall comes early in the north. With the arrival of shorter days and frosty nights, a plumage change occurs among the adults they begin to lose their striking black and white appearance of summer and soon look more like juveniles with the dull gray garb they will wear into winter. These changes signal the end of the breeding season and the beginning of preparations for the long flight back to the sea where they are assured of open water and where they can feed and survive the cold. The young loons are now completely independent of their parents. They remain together but also join other juveniles in preparations for the migration to the ocean. Adults leave the lakes first. 
The juveniles are the last to leave fresh water. They will spend the next three years on the ocean until they too are ready to return to the lakes and mate. For people who love the sight of loons and thrill to their magical calls, the departure of these marvelous birds is a sad time. But loons need to get back to the ocean to open water before the lakes freeze. When they arrive, the cycle of the loon is completed. They spend the next four or five months here. It will be spring again before we hear and see them on the northern lakes and children and adults cry, look, the loons are back. <laughs>